Good morning, class. Today we're going to be talking about encapsulation. You should have cloned your GitHub project, and it should look something like this. If you haven't yet, go accept that GitHub Classrooms assignment, clone the project, get it open, pause the video, come back, and uh, we'll go ahead and begin. So we have right here a solution, Vector Math, and notice that it is made of three projects, Vector Exercises, Vector Library, and Vector Math Test. Now, there's a couple things to understand here. One is that in Visual Studio, uh, we actually often will break a large software system into multiple projects. And that allows us to encapsulate the functionality of some part of the bigger picture within these smaller projects. In this case, we have three. We have one, which is a console application, and you guys have built these before. We have one which is a library application, and I believe you guys have done that in 300, and if you haven't, we'll learn how to do that today. And we have a test project as well, and I know you guys have worked with test projects in 300. So each one of these has its different role to play. The library project provides some functionality that we want to be able to use in other kinds of applications. So in this case, the vector exercise console application will be using classes out of that vector library to do its work. And the vector math test will test the classes that are defined in this vector library to make sure that they work the way we expected them to. So that we actually wrote them correctly and they did uh, exactly what we're intending for them to do. Now, as you might guess from the name, we're going to be playing with uh, vectors today. So mathematical vectors, in this case, three element vectors. Um, so let's start with that library. We're going to go ahead and add to that. A class, so we come down to add a new item. And we're going to call this vector three. So this is going to represent a three element vector. Now, a couple of things that have changed if you're using the older versions of Visual Studio. One is by default, uh, classes are now declared internal rather than public or private or any of the other possibilities. What does internal mean? Well, the other idea that comes with um, encapsulation is the idea of data hiding, protecting the stuff that you've encapsulated uh, so that you're only exposing it to code outside of uh, whatever unit you're working with if that was really your intent. So internal is the default because internal says only this assembly. So in this case, the vector library assembly is allowed to use this class or even know about this class. And that's not what we want because we want to be able to use this class in vector exercises. So instead of using internal, we need to change this to the public. And let me go back and hit the idea of assembly a little bit more. What is an assembly for a vector library, for a library class? Well, it's a DLL. It compiles down into what we call a dynamically linked library, which is just a type of file. Whereas a console app like Vector Exercises compiles down to an executable file, so a file you can double click on and it will run. A DLL won't run, it doesn't have any kind of instructions as to what it's supposed to do. Uh, so just a little bit of clarity, and we'll see that when we uh, go ahead and write this. We'll build it and we'll take a look at the folder it's in and see that DLL gets generated. Okay, so we have a class vector. We're going to de define some fields. And I'm going to go ahead and make these public. Uh, now, that's not normally the practice we do, and we'll come back and when we talk about properties, we'll talk about how to do this more appropriately for object orientation. But we're going to do a public uh, double. We're going to use doubles to represent each of our vector components, x, and a public double y, and a public double z. So these are the x, y, and z components of this vector. A vector, of course, is mapping to a three-dimensional space, and it's basically just going uh, in a particular direction. Now, you guys have studied this in calculus. If you're in this class, you've already taken Calc 1 and Calc 2. Uh, so this should be fairly familiar to you. Uh, if not, go look it up online. There's a lot of really good resources out there. And, of course, you've written a lot of constructors. So public vector 3, which is going to define a constructor to build this. And we'll go ahead and have a double X, a double Y, and a double Z come into arguments. All right. So this brings us to another form of encapsulation. This X, Y, and Z only exist within the scope of this function. So we can't actually use them outside of the scope of this function. Just like these fields, oops, 
And this actually should be defined within the same class body. So these guys exist within this class. These arguments only exist within this method. So they are encapsulated to the method. These public fields are encapsulated to the class vector three. So that is another form of encapsulation, another way that's applied. We call that scope when we say this variable only exists within this space. Uh, so these are scoped to the method, and these are scoped to the object that's constructed from the vector three. Now, in order to hold on to these values, we're going to assign them to those class variables, uh, to those fields. So x is going to be assigned, big X is going to be assigned little x, big Y is going to be assigned little y, big Z is going to be assigned little z. And that stores them, and now they're part of this vector. Now, you've written classes like this in 300 and in 200. I'm going to actually change this from a class to a struct. And the reason I'm doing that is because the way we're going to use them in this particular exercise is very much like a struct. And I want to talk about structs as uh, a form of encapsulation as well as classes, which, again, we'll take a harder look at classes in a bit. Um, probably not in this exercise, but the next exercise will actually really get into classes. Uh, so a struct is something that actually kind of preceded the idea of object orientation. And we often call these compound data types in computer science. And that just means we take multiple variables, we bind them together into a single thing, a structure, hence the name struct, and we can access those, but then we can pass around the object, it's, uh, the structure itself. So this was actually a really important idea that led into object orientation, the idea of gathering together state into a single container and encapsulating it there. So we're encapsulating the state of this vector which is basically the x and the y and the z component describing where it is in space. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and write a library class to actually play with some of that. So we're going to create a new class here. We're going to call this vector map. And again, Notice that it declares it as internal. We want it to be public. So we can use it outside of this assembly, this code assembly. Now, the other thing we want to do with this public class is we want to declare it static. And just like I showed you structs to show you something that was really part of the evolution to get to this point, uh, a static class in C Sharp is very similar to the idea of modules that emerged in a lot of imperative uh, programming languages. And basically, a module is just collecting a bunch of methods together, a bunch of functions together, putting them into a single place where you can call them and keeping them organized basically by some kind of theme. And you've used this in C Sharp. You've used the math library a lot. So math.pow, for example, to take a number and take, raise it to a power, or math.square root to calculate the square root, or tangent, or cosine, or sine. All of those are bundled in that math library, along with some constants like pi, uh, and um, uh, there's probably some others in there, but pi is the one that, that occurs to me. Uh, and you use all of those uh, together whenever you need to do something mathematically oriented in your C-sharp programming. So we're going to do something similar. We're going to create a public static class for vector math. So this is going to be a library of functions for working with vectors. So we have public static class of vector math. Um, I'm going to add a method, public, and then we need to declare our return type. So if you remember uh, all of those rules from your last class, I know we're refreshing a little bit. We're going to return a vector 3, and this method is going to be add. So we're actually going to take two vectors, vector 3s, add them together, return the result. So vector 3a, vector 3b. And what we're going to do is basically return a brand new vector that is not vector A or vector B, but the sum of vector A and vector B. And when we um, create uh, or do a sum of a vector, what we actually do is we sum their components. The new vector's x value is going to be the x of A plus the x of B. So we'd say A dot x plus A dot B or P dot x for that first component. And then we do a dot y plus b dot y for the second component. 
and a dot z plus b dot z for the third component. All right, so that is our, our add and subtract, very similar. Except we take uh, the a and we subtract from it the values from, of the components from the vector b. So a dot x minus b dot x, a dot y minus b dot y, and a dot z minus b dot z. And that should give us uh, our next vector. Um, let's see that. Uh, we also might want to add some other things like uh, multiplying our vectors. And there's actually several forms of vector multiplication, cross product, dot product, scalar product. Um, and we might do things like calculating the magnitude and a lot of other things. But that's not really the point of this exercise. So I'm going to put a pause on that. And we're going to, to kind of move on to actually building this out and seeing how it works. Um, oh, and also because these are methods in a static class, they also need to be declared static for them to actually work the way we expect them to. So a static method basically means that there's only one method. It's attached to the class, not to the object. So you can't actually call it from an object. Now, we couldn't create a static class, uh, so there's no reason for it to have regular methods in it. A static method is more like a function that is attached to the name of the class. So vector math dot add is what we would call uh, to actually do that. In fact, let's review. We'll go ahead and do magnitude too. Let's do that. Public static uh, the magnitude is going to be a double because we're going to calculate just a single value not a vector 3 uh, magnitude magnitude just takes a vector and figures out what its length is so if you remember your distance formula you take the square of the x plus the square of the y plus the square of the z and you take the square root of that so how we call a static class uh, is method, static method, is we put in the name of the static class. Notice that it's telling us system.math is a class, a static class that provides constants and static methods for trigonometric, logarithmic, and other uh, math type stuff. Uh, so we can actually say in here we want the square root, which they use an abbreviated form, SQRT, and then it takes a double. Well, that double is going to be the result of our A being squared. One of the ways we can produce a square is just multiply a number by itself. Uh, we could also use math.pow and put 2 as a second argument, but uh, I'm going to do this just because I think it's a little bit faster. So a dot x times a dot x. No b vector here. a dot y times a dot y and a dot z times a dot z. So here we actually have an example where we are using one of the existing set static system classes, so the static system library, and then we're doing our own version, our, our own library as well. All right, now you can actually build any of these assemblies separate from the others. So let's right click on our, our vector library here and just go tell it to build. And it looks like we failed. Uh, the type or namespace vector could not be found. I don't see that. Let's see where this error actually is. Is our error list? Oh, yeah, right there. And uh, that constructor should be a vector 3. And no overload. Oh, so these should be added together. That's the sum of the squares of the components that we feed into that distance formula. And I think I know. Actually, you know what? That should be a multiply. So I've got those out of order. Okay, we're going to go ahead and leave it like that because that's going to help us demonstrate something important. So now we've saved our class, we can go ahead and build. So again, we can right click to say build, or you can do control B. Uh, we don't want to build the whole solution here, I'm just building one project. You can separate them out and deal with them separately. So notice here that it tells us that it has now built, especially this last part, vector library.dll. 
And if we were to browse to that location, and one of the ways we can do that is we can just open in File Explorer on uh, Visual Studio Explorer. Project Solution Explorer, it should open that up for me. Open folder and file explorer. Oh, it's doing that, it's down on my bar. There we go. So this is the result of this is the folder that contains our project. And if we drill down into the binary folder, when we build and debug, we get a debug folder in here. When we build a release, we get a release folder. And inside of those are the results of the compilation. So in this case, uh, we have to drill down a little bit more because then dumped it in .NET or .NET 6.0, which is the version of C# -sharp in the .NET library we're using. And notice there we have our DLL file. So this is the file that it actually built. And if we bop up a little bit, if we look in, for example, uh, one of the others, they wouldn't have anything in them yet because we haven't built those. All right. So let's go talk about our vector map tests. So this project's whole purpose is in here, this file, if you're wondering, uh, this is just describing, this is XML that describes what's in the project. Uh, so these are kind of interesting, you can read them. You right click and say properties, it gives you the same thing and kind of a GUI sort of look. I prefer the XML because I understand what XML is. I would encourage you to get familiar and comfortable with it. Um, but you can also use the, the form view if you prefer. Okay, so if we look at this vector map unit tests, I've already written some class, uh, some test process code for you. So we have, for example, constructing a vector should set its state. Now these tests may look a little bit different than you're used to. I think you guys have previously used in unit for your testing. Here we're using X unit, uh, so it's a slightly different approach, uh, but the same idea. You're basically writing methods and then you're testing them. In this case, um, we're checking can we set the state and we're providing a couple of examples we want to try where we create the vector with the constructor, we plug in these values that are being passed in, x, y, and z, which in the first one is 0, 0, and 0. On the second try, it does 1, 5, and 7. Third try, it does negative 3, uh, 12.34, 3, 5, 5, 3, and then 8. Uh, so it plugs those in, and then it just checks that all the components are set correctly. And then we have something like that for the sum, and then we have for the difference. So there's three methods that we implemented. There's also one for the magnitude that's commented out. Uh, so we could uncomment that and make sure that that, that works as we expect. In fact, let's go ahead and do that since we did go ahead and write our magnitude. Uh, so we'll just pull that out of the common without code so that it is now accessible. Okay. Now, if we were to run these tests, it's not going to work because you can see that we actually have a number of errors showing up in our errors. And they're all basically telling us, I don't know what vector library is. I don't know what vector 3 is. Remember that those are defined in this assembly, and this assembly has no idea that they exist. So the first thing we need to do is tell this assembly that they do exist. And we do that by adding a dependency. So every project has a dependency uh, entry in Visual Studio Explorer, and they can be lots of different types of references. Uh, in this case, we want a project reference. So this basically just allows us to say, I want you to reference another project in the solution. So you're going to use, in our case, the vector library uh, project. You're going to get access to it. You're going to be able to use all of its stuff. So we'll go ahead and say OK. And now you notice that it's not complaining as hard, but it is still uh, complaining uh, that uh, these are not known. Vector 3 is not known. Now up here, I actually what well, some example code. This is not in your code. It just says vector three for you. So if we were to add vector three library dot vector three, it will stop complaining. Or sorry, vector library dot vector three. It should stop complaining about that one particular entry. Notice there's no red underline now. And why is that? Well, if we go look at our vector three structure, notice that we have defined that in the vector library namespace. So the full name of this class is vector library dot vector three. And we can nest as many deeply as we want. We could have um, more periods in there and, and kind of have multiple namespaces. But the important idea is that's its full name. Kind of like you have a probably a first name, a last name, or a family name, and a given name, maybe a middle name, maybe even more names than that. But generally speaking, we probably only refer to you by your given name. 
uh, to keep a common name. Sometimes in our classes, we'll have multiple students who have the same given name. Uh, there's been many semesters where I've had three or four Johns or three or four Sams or uh, any common name, in which case, to distinguish between those folks, you might actually say, oh, I want John Smith, or I'm talking to John Brown right now, and you have to use the fully full name of the person to really disambiguate. And that's important, uh, and that's actually what namespaces are for, uh, is to help us disambiguate. But if we know that there's only one class with that particular name uh, that we're going to be dealing with, then maybe we don't want to have to type out um, this vector library dot in front of everything. And that's where using statements come in. So using statement just says, pull everything out of that namespace, just make it available, I'm not worried about name collisions. Uh, so uh, in your previous semesters, you would type at the top of this file using, uh, in this case, a vector library. Now, as of the newest version of C Sharp, they've actually added something called global using statements. Uh, so let's see how those, those differ. So if I were to say, for example, up here, uh, using uh, vector library, you notice all these go away, but this only holds for this one file. A global using statement has global in front of it. And that means that the entire project now has opened this namespace and will be using that specific namespace. Now, if you want to use global using statements, uh, rather than putting them in a particular file, which makes them harder to find, best practice is to put them in a file named usings.cs. So notice we already have the X unit in there. So we'd do global using vector library. And as soon as we do that, these tests stop completely because now they know where the vector three comes from as well as um, the vector math class, the static vector math class. Notice again with a static class we say the static class name and then dot and the static method name that we're calling. And this is basically equivalent to a function name in other languages. This is how we refer to static uh, methods. So now that we've done that, we could go ahead and build our vector math test project. And when we do this, oh, we failed. Uh, we must have missed an error. Let's see what we missed. Vector math does not contain a definition for normalized. Hmm. Oh, because what I uncommented was not magnitude, but was normalized, which is another thing we can do with vectors, which is basically uh, take a vector, create a new one that points in the same direction, but has unit length or length one. So let's make sure we uncomment the correct test. Let's try building that again. So we have one succeeded, one up to date. So we actually tried to build two projects here. What did we try to build? Well, because vector math test depends on vector library, Visual Studio first built that, or tried to, and said, oh, well, actually, it's up to date. I don't need to build it. And then built this vector math test. An important thing that happens during that process, it builds that DLL, and it copies that DLL into the build folder for this test project. Now, test projects are also DLLs. So now we have a DLL referencing another DLL, and the test DLLs are intended to be accessed by a special executable called a test runner. And that's just a program that gets in there and runs all the test methods. And in this case, um, or actually in pretty much all our cases, we can uh, run our tests for uh, any Visual Studio by going to the test menu and saying, run all tests. And that's going to go actually build everything in our project. And notice it tried to build all three. It says all three up to date. Then it's going to run that uh, static or that test runner against that and give us that information in uh, the test explorer. So if we look at our test explorer, now it's telling us what tests have run, how long it took to run those tests, and which ones are passing and failing. And notice our magnitude uh, test is failing, and we actually supply different arguments here. So the very first one uh, was all zeros. That one succeeded, all the rest failed. Now if they're all zeros, then that maybe tells us something about what's wrong. 
And if we go back and look at our vector math class, uh, remember we uh, said we had a little error there. So we have the square of the x's plus the square of the y's, but this is not the square, this is the sum. So we need to multiply there. And if we make that one little change, and then go back to our test explorer and run those tests again. Uh, once it compiles that change, runs everything, they're all passing. So we've done our work correctly. Uh, we know that now that our vector math library is actually working the way we expect. And this also helps highlight why we have test projects. Why we write test projects is to verify that our code is behaving as we expect it is, so that when we get into actually using that somewhere, it does what we want it to do. And clearly, we would have an incorrect length for those vectors if we hadn't caught that particular bug. So we really need to find those errors in our code, suss them out early, and take care of them. Testing is one of the most powerful tools in our kit for doing that. Okay, and then we have our vector exercises project. And I want to point out another new feature. Uh, so for those of you that have been programming in earlier versions of C-sharp, this may look a little weird. This is a console application. But what you probably have noticed is there is no static uh, class program, and there's no static void method main uh, that is actually our main uh, method. And this is one of the other improvements they added, I believe, in uh, C Sharp version 10, it might have been 9. Uh, but this is a, a top level script. So instead of making you write that static class inside uh, with that static main method, you can now, if all you would do is have a body for your main method, you can just write that body here. And that will actually just be what we execute. Uh, and what it's doing under the hood is it actually will go ahead and build out that static program with the static void main, and it sticks this code inside of it. This is one of the things C Sharp and Visual Studio does a lot, is they have a lot of these compiler tricks where they give you a shorthand form of something so that you can write something very quickly and get it off the ground. And then under the hood, when you compile, it actually kind of adds in all the missing boilerplate code so that it actually compiles and runs the way C Sharp needs it to run, or the .NET does. So this is part of trying to make your, your code, uh, your, you more productive as a programmer by avoiding having to write a lot of what we call boilerplate code, so code that just gets repeated over and over uh, that really doesn't change from program to program. Like every console app we've written before we started using this always had a static uh, program class and a static void main. Uh, that always had an argument, uh, a string array named args, which were the command line arguments that would have gotten passed in from the operating system. So all of those pieces have always been there. And they said, you know what, let's not make you type those all the time, so let's simplify and streamline it. So if you have a program.cs and you're using uh, the later version to Visual C, or C Sharp, you can actually um, skip writing out the class. All right, and then the other thing uh, you'll notice, this one is bolded, these other ones aren't. That means this is the default project. So if we hit that green button that you're so used to running, uh, clicking, that's the project that's actually going to be run or executed. And it's important because actually this is the only one that can be executed. If we tried to execute vector library, it would tell us it's a DLL, I can't execute it. And you, if you tried to do vector math and run it, it would, uh, <laughs> again, you'd be told, that's a, a library, I can't execute it because they don't have the ability to be executed. Only an executable file, which is the result of a console or a GUI app that you're building uh, that generates an executable, an exe file, is able to actually be run. All right, let's go ahead and run our, our, our full program now. And you notice it prints at the command line, hello, vectors, and then exits. And if we look back at the program, it's exactly what we'd expect. It just says, oh, okay, we're going to print that. Uh, let's go ahead and create some vectors. So now we want maybe a vector 3, and let's call this 1, and create a new vector 3, and 1, 1, 1. So this is the, a unit vector, or not a unit vector because its length is not 1, its length is actually a bit longer than 1 because again, uh, we'd be calculating the square of the sum of the squares of these and then just by rooting it. Uh, but it's a vector where all the components are one. Not a unit vector, but a vector. And notice that uh, it Visual Studio tried to understand what I was doing. It said, oh, you want the system numerics namespace. 
And that's because Windows does have a vector class defined, a vector3 class defined in that uh, system uh, dot numerics. And if we look, it's even given us a definition. Now there's something a little bit different about this. They're using floats, not doubles like we are. So a float is a smaller precision than a double. It's half the precision of a double, so it can't represent quite as large a range of potential values. Uh, but it's good enough for most of our, our work. This is not the one we want to be using. We want to be using the one that we wrote. Uh, and this is one of the things you really have to be careful about with Visual Studio. Visual Studio tries to give you a ton of help, and sometimes that help is not actually the help we want. Uh, in fact, uh, I would almost recommend turning off as many of those features as you can as you're learning, so that you can really focus on learning what you need to learn. And then when you become an expert programmer, you can turn them back on and have all the, the assistance. But one of the things that's very important when you're learning is you actually get the chance to grapple with things and really see where they go in. And having something that automatically fills stuff in for you is actually going to make your learning process a lot harder because you don't know where that came from. And if you have to replicate that somewhere else, say on a paper exam, you're kind of out of luck because you don't really understand what was going on. Uh, so yeah, this is not the using we want. Uh, we want to be using the vector math library. In fact, we could go ahead and put that in using vector library. And notice that it tells us, oh, I don't know that, that uh, namespace. That doesn't exist for me. And again, it's because we haven't pulled that DLL into this project. So we need to go to the dependi dependencies, add a project reference, and say, we actually want access to that vector library. And then that using statement copy. Now we could use a global using and put this in a using file, but since this is the only file in our project, there's really not a good call for that. There's no need for it. So let's go ahead and just do this. And let's uh, create a second vector three. Let's call this one two. Two, two, two. And console dot right line. And actually, before we do that, let's sum those two together. So, vector, I'll just call this one three. And let's say vector math dot add one and two. So we're going to add those two vectors and we're going to take the result. We're going to write it out to the console. Um, so with a right line, you've probably done stuff like this, where you say one colon space one plus, or sorry, let's do x, y, and z, and let's do our sum of those. No, actually, let's do one. One dot x is one dot x plus comma one dot y colon and space. Plus one dot y plus one dot z colon space plus one dot z. Now, I imagine you've done a lot of string concatenation like that. Um, let's go ahead and run that and just make sure that that does what we expect it to. And you can see there it prints out one dot x is one, one dot y is one, one dot z is one. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Let's do a slightly different way of doing that. And this is what's called a template string. So this is a form of syntactic sugar. Syntactic sugar just means a new way of writing some code, a new syntax for writing stuff that we already could do in a different way, but hopefully makes it cleaner and easier for us. Uh, so notice that we have a string. We precede it with a dollar sign. That's what makes this a template string. And we're going to say 2.x colon, and then we're going to do curly braces, and inside that curly brace we'll say 1.x, comma, and, or sorry, not 1, we want 2. We're going to print number 2. And then we can go ahead and have y, again, the curly braces, 2.y, comma, z, colon, Dot z. So what it does is basically takes anything inside these curly braces 
evaluates it if, if it is expression. Uh, so in this case, we're just returning the value of the field and then concatenates it into the string at that point. So this is essentially the same thing that we're doing here, but the syntax is, I think, a lot cleaner and easier to read and you don't have to worry about, did I remember that space and where's the comma falling? Uh, I think they're a lot easier to write that way. And of course, it also needs to be spelled correctly. And if we do that, uh, then we can go ahead and run this again. And we should get our two oop, builders. Oop. Do not capitalize the R and right line. There we go. Oop. And the I. I was typing too fast and it didn't quite register that I let go of the shift. Okay, here we go. So there we have one dot x, one dot y, one dot z, and then we have two dot x. I forgot the two dot in front of the y and the z, but you can see we're getting what we want out of it. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Dot y, dot z. And then, let's be really lazy on this one. Let's write it mathematically. So if you've done vectors in a math class, we use uh, usually the angle bracket to indicate the start of a vector. And curly brace, 3 dot x, comma, curly brace, 3 dot y, comma, 3 dot z. All right. I'm going to take out the space. So if we do that, that should show us x, y, and z are going to be 3, 3, 3 showing our sum was working as we expected. And let's go ahead and calculate the magnitude. And just to show you that we can put any kind of expression in here, we're going to go ahead and use our vector math, or vector library, dot, I'm sorry, vector math library, dot, magnitude and put inside of that our vector named three. And notice that it's perfectly happy with this because what's going to happen is this statement is going to be evaluated. So we're going to call that method. It's going to return a double. That double is then going to get concatenated into the string. Um, and of course we just need a semicolon at the end. And I think we should be hit up and also Rels and right line. We don't want that. So if we get all of our syntax errors taken care of, we should be able to run this. And notice that it tells us our magnitude of that uh, vector is 5.19. And that's kind of what we'd expect because it's going to be uh, the square root of one of 3 squared plus 3 squared plus 3 squared. So it's going to be a little less than 6, which is about where it falls. So that, that is what we expect. All right, so at this point, we've talked about several forms of encapsulation. We've talked about how scope is really a form of encapsulation, and that's important. I know you guys have all learned about scope in 200 and 300, but one of the things to understand, early programs did not have a concept of scope. A variable that was declared existed in the entire program, uh, which can get very problematic if your program starts getting large. We talked about encapsulating state into a shared state, a structure, or a compound data type, so that we could take related things like the x, y, and z of a point or a vector and put them into a single structure that we could then reference uh, with a single variable name rather than needing to have three variable names to refer to every vector that we had in our class. So again, encapsulation makes it a lot easier to think about and work with that code. Uh, then we also talked about encapsulating functions, taking functions, we're wrapping them in a library so that we can call those. Now the next big evolution is where object-oriented programming comes in, where instead of just encapsulating your functions and encapsulating your state in separate things, so a struct and into functions, we combine those ideas and encapsulate related state and behavior of related functions and related variables into one class, which then constructs objects that have uh, that state and the, the methods to operate on that state. That's what object orientation is really pushing towards and where encapsulation fits into that. And we're going to take a good hard look at that next. All right, thanks for your time. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you submit this project.
uh, as we've defined it here. And then if you want to go back and add the additional functionality of the vector math library as an exercise to kind of uh, shake off the rust and get back into the swing of programming, we'll see you soon.